It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Beat Muckley. He's a third year resident in our clinic. He started his training in the US and joined us recently uh, a few months ago. And uh, he will be talking about an important topic and about colon obstruction. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you for the introduction and welcome to the resident lecture this morning about colon obstruction. I'd like to start out with a case presentation. It's a 43-year-old female who presented since the morning with acute abdominal pain. She has a remarkable past medical history for a personality disorder and several suicide attempts. No previous abdominal surgeries and no medications. On exam, she has a diffusely tender abdomen, a tympanic abdomen, but no peritonitic sign. A CT scan is performed and shows the following picture. <coughs> Does anyone have any ideas about the differential diagnosis at this point? I think there's some kind of obstruction. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll come back to this case presentation at a later point to talk a little bit more in detail. A quick overview of the presentation. We'll start out with some numbers about the epidemiology. Then we'll go into mechanical obstructions with colorectal obstruction and different kinds of vulvas. <coughs> represented here by, um, by malignant colorectal obstruction. Then we'll go into uh, suit obstructions with the Ogilvy syndrome, represented here by this dilated proximal colon, and then into toxic megacolon ulcerative colitis and ulcerative colitis. And we'll round up the presentation with some conclusions and bullet points. So about the epidemiology, um, about 10% of all patients who present to the ER present with some kind of abdominal or intestinal obstruction. This can be small bowel, but also large bowel. Of these, about one quarter, or 25%, are um, colon obstruction. 75% of these are, uh, require some kind of surgical intervention at some point during the hospitalization or during the hospital course. The large majority of the um, colonic obstruction are due to uh, malignant disease, uh, 70%. And then cecal vulvulus, sigmoid vulvulus, and diverticular disease, each are responsible for about 10% or a little less than 10%. But there's also a myriad of causes that can cause um, colorectal obstruction or um, distal colonic obstruction, and we'll go into these different causes a little later as well in the presentation. So first, mechanical obstruction. What's the patient population we're dealing with with patients that present with acute obstruction or acute uh, colonic obstruction? For sigmoid vulvulus, these are more, com more commonly older patients, more than 70 years of age. Um, they have some kind of neuropsychiatric disorder. That's a, certainly a risk factor. They're often institutionalized. They have chronic constipation and some kind of chronic dysmotility. Um, also, a longer sigmoid and kind of a different patient population is a risk factor. <coughs> For sigmoid vulvulus, this often affects younger females between the age of 30 and 60, so kind of different population. Uh, for colorectal cancer, the HI presentation is quite old, it's 73 years old, and 30% of all patients who present with a colorectal cancer present with some kind of obstructive symptom, which is kind of surprising uh, given that there's a routine screening in place. The patient presentation is a little more insidious than for uh, small bowel obstruction. It's quite nonspecific, can be bloating, abdominal pain, obstipation. The clinical exam shows um, distension, tympanism. This doesn't mean that patients cannot present with acute picture, with sepsis, um, even abdominal compartment syndrome, or signs of shock. But that's certainly the minority. The majority is more uh, nonspecific and not as acute as for small bowel obstruction. Next, I would like to go over some imaging, some typical imaging pictures for colonic obstruction or for vulvulus. Here, the first one on this sparium enema. <clears throat> Does anyone have an idea what that could represent or how this sign is called? Maybe one of the students. I think omega sign. Omega sign? Um, I've never heard of that. Possible. <laughs> but um, what you can see here actually is a bird's beak sign. I guess that's the, the how the sign is typically called, we can see the barium rising up here, but the torsed sigmoid that doesn't uh, let the contrast through. 
also illustrated here by Bert's beak. <laughs> uh, next, we have this abdominal um, radiograph, this abdominal x-ray, very typical sign as well. Anyone have an idea here? A coffee bean sign? Exactly, coffee bean sign. And that's typical for a sigmoid volvulus, but can also be <coughs> for a cecal volvulus. <laughs> and then next, the structure here of the, the torus mesenterium, which is uh, typical for any kind of colonic volvulus, so it can be sigmoid or cecal. And that's a rural sign, uh, also very typical. And at the same time, these three uh, imaging modalities also represent the, the tools we have available for the workup of colonic obstruction. So this is um, barium enema and then abdominal x-rays, <coughs> which are very handy to follow a patient over time, easily available and easily performed, doesn't take a lot of time. And then kind of the gold standard that we have today, which is the CT scan, very specific and very sensitive. Uh, we'll come back to the case presentation in the beginning uh, that we talked about quickly. So the patient underwent the CT scan, it showed the cecal volvulus and it was decided to take the patient to the OR at this point. Um, the gold standard for the treatment of uh, cecal volvulus is right hemicolectomy or iliacolic resection and that's also <laughs> what the patient underwent. In some cases conservative management can be attempted but it's not really recommended. Um, there's a high risk of perforation with, for example, um, a colonoscopy <laughs> and colonic necrosis can be missed in up to 20 to 25 percent of the patients. Here we see interoperative pictures from the, the resection that the patient underwent with the torus segment of the bowel that you can see here. And then here the detorus bowel but some uh, necrosis in the cecum here right before the perforation. Patient on the went through section and did fine after. Uh, the picture looks quite different for the sigmoid volvulus. There's a different treatment algorithm and the uh, operative uh, management may be at the later point. It's not at the forefront for um, <coughs> this picture. So once the diagnosis of a sigmoid volvulus uh, is made, if there, is there, if there is evidence of bowel ischemia, obviously the patient needs to go to the operating room. However, if there's no evidence of bowel ischemia, uh, endoscopic detorsion can be, be attempted first. If that is successful, a rectal tube can be placed and the sigmoid resected during the same admission uh, in an elective setting or in a semi-elective setting. If there is chemo changes on the endoscopy, patient needs to go to the operating room. Or if the endoscopic detorsion is unsuccessful, patient needs to go to the operating room as well. Um, if once the diagnosis or once the decision is taken to go to the operating room, there's different modalities or different surgical strategies available. Uh, it can be done laparoscopically or also open. Next, I would like to go over a paper or um, a study from Van der Nall et al. <coughs> he performed a study in, uh, in Africa where the incidence of sigma vulva is much higher in young, uh, otherwise healthy males because of a uh, anatomically longer sigmoid. Um, and also the setting is kind of particular that they don't have uh, routinely endoscopists available and there's a need for definitive surgery so uh, because of the distances between the medical centers and also the patients. He performed uh, what he did and what we also do here um, sometimes he did a mini laparotomy inframbilically he managed to mobilize the whole colon through the small incision five to seven centimeters uh, performed a resection and then a hands-on anastomosis with a total or a time of less than an hour. Um, he didn't do any P operative decompression and managed to do this um, procedures operation safely uh, in the 31 patients that he did with a low morbidity and mortality overall. Next, I'd like to uh, quickly go over a second case presentation. It's the one of a 74-year-old male who presented with acute or kind of more uh, chronic abdominal, lower abdominal pain that has been present for a week, so a little longer. Also some nausea, diarrhea. Past medical history is quite unremarkable. No previous abdominal surgeries, no medications. On exam, he has a bloated abdomen, high-pitched bowel sounds, um, and a panic sign. Uh, CT scan is performed and shows the following picture. Also a very typical sign 
uh, an apple core lesion in the distal colon. <clears throat> so the diagnosis of a colorectal cancer is made and the patient underwent the resection during the same admission. This brings us to the next topic, which is colorectal malignancy. In Switzerland, about 1,000 patients present yearly with obstructing or some kind of uh, obstructing symptom with colorectal lesions. Most lesions are located distally, about 40% in the sigmoid colon, 10% uh, in the rectum, and 5% in the anus. CT is the imaging modality of choice. It has a very high sensitivity and specificity, and is definitely has um, taken over from Barium Enema for the uh, main workup for these patients. What about the surgical management? I'll quickly go over some uh, treatment strategies with, uh, for these patients presenting with a colorectal malignancy and some obstructing symptoms. Um, first, obviously, the patient needs to be resuscitated, electrolyte needs to be corrected, uh, and then a, a surgery needs to be performed in um, an emergent or semi-emergent setting. If the patient uh, presents very dramatically, has signs of shock, um, is very ill, has a high chance of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, or has a high comorbidity load, a Hartman procedure is indicated with resection of the lesion and then uh, an end colostomy. However, if the patient presents with a right-sided lesion, is otherwise healthy, uh, has incomplete obstruction, and no or low comorbidities, a segmental resection can be attempted. Um, However, if the patient has synchronous lesion in the left colon or has some compromised uh, left-sided, a subtotal colectomy can also be indicated. And Dr. Kazer actually published on that in 2012 and showed that this can be um, done safely with a low uh, leakage rate. And next we'll quickly go over kind of a hot topic in the field, uh, which is colonic stenting. It has previously proposed as a bridge to surgery, allowing for complete staging and also avoiding surgery and disseminated um, the disease. Um, here we have the first multi-centric randomized control trial, which was published in 2011 by a Dutch group. They included 98 patients with severe left-sided obstruction that's been present for at least one week. Um, they excluded patients which were already perforated had a lesion that was very low, less than 10 centimeters from the anal verge, and the high uh, comorbidity load. Their findings were quite surprising that the trial had to be stopped because of higher morbidity in the stent group. They had a high perforation rate, which was 20%, and also a higher leakage rate. What was a little special about this study, that they included all the complications um, from the stent placement, but also from the resection that was done during the same admission. So not only the stent placement, um, and compare this to the initial resection. Also for the perforation, they included silent perforation that were detected on resection. So not only frank perforations that um, presented immediately, but also perforations at the later point. Also surprising was that they had a low technical success rate of only 70% um, successful stand placement, which was much lower than previously reported. Uh, this would might have been due to that a high array of these patients were uh, presenting with complete obstruction. They didn't find any difference in mortality or stoma rate at six months, and also no difference in quality of life. So in summary, I think uh, colonic stenting definitely needs to be treated with caution, can have a place for a very select group of patients, but overall is not um, the miracle treatment that has been proposed uh, earlier. Next, I'll just quickly go over some other costs of mechanical colorectal obstruction. These can be um, very different, a myriad of different causes. Can be endometriosis, Crohn's disease, diverticulitis, which is actually the most common of um, uh, all the other causes. Anastomotic stenosis, hernia, retroperitoneal processes or malignancies, and also uh, gallstone alias with a few case reports um, reporting this as a um, possible cause. Next, I would like to go on to colonic uh, suit obstruction here represented by Ogilvy syndrome and toxic megacolon. 
Uh, Ogilvy syndrome <clears throat> is a pseudo obstruction that is not caused by uh, a mechanical or it does not have a mechanical cause of obstruction. It's more common in the proximal cecum and the right colon and affects mostly older patients. It's first been prescribed in 1948 by Sir uh, Ogilvy, who published two cases of retroperitoneal cancer, uh, the celiac <coughs> plexus invasion and parasympathetic deprivation. Uh, often these patients present with trauma, um, uh, with fractures, obstetric trauma, uh, very complex uh, medical patients with uh, MIs, pneumonias, or chemotherapy, uh, also retroperitoneal malignancy as uh, prescribed, uh, described first by Ogilvy can be a cause. In addition, uh, electrolyte imbalances and some uh, narcotic medications or calcium channel blockers need to be present as well. The diagnosis consists of routine lab. Uh, if there is diarrhea present, stool cultures need to be taken to rule out C. diff colitis. And then CT imaging uh, is the modality of choice, the imaging modality of choice. This is to rule out the mechanical obstruction and then also to diagnose any uh, other form of intra-abdominal <coughs> process, like for example, uh, retroperitoneal malignancy. The treatment algorithm we went over this morning report, I think, uh, two weeks ago, quickly. Um, so here again, if there's acute colonic distension present, mechanical obstruction needs to be ruled out first. That's kind of the first step that needs to be done. If there is a pseudo obstruction present, conservative management with IV fluid, uh, anti-tube, and then uh, MPO can be attempted. And obviously treat any reversible causes. If there's partial or no response, uh, new stigma can be administered. And actually, Ponek and all showed in 1999 that uh, 17 out of 18 patients responded to new stigma with a complete resolution of the colonic distension. However, if there's no or partial response, uh, colonic decompression with the placement of a rectal tube can be attempted. If there's still no response, uh, surgical management needs to be evaluated. <clears throat> Uh, indications for surgery right from the beginning are obviously perforation, peritonitis, or then a cecal diameter of more than 12 centimeters, since studies have shown that if the diameter goes <coughs> above 12 centimeters, the risk of perforation drastically increases. Here are also some pictures. These pictures are actually from the publication from Ponek et al., and they show here first drastic, dramatic colonic distension. And then 24 hours later, after the administration of nystigma, a complete resolution of this distension. <clears throat> Next, we'd like to go on to toxic megacolon, which is defined by colonic distension and diarrhea. Also, three factors of these box need to be present with a fever, tachycardia, leukocytosis, or anemia. And then one factor, this box here, with dehydration, uh, electrolyte imbalances, hypertension, or altered sensorium. Often these patients are very ill, um, and colonoscopy for a workup is not recommended given the high risk of perforation. Uh, toxic megacolon has kind of two different etiologies, two different causes. One of them is IBD, or a most commonly ulcerative colitis. Often these patients present very early in the course of disease, 30% within three months, and then 60% within three years. Um, signs of colitis often are present before the onset of toxic megacolon, uh, and an improvement in diarrhea might actually herald the onset of, uh, of this megacolon. What you can see here is, again, uh, diffusely dilated colonal proximal colon with um, hostile markings that do not extend over the whole colon, which is very typical for um, toxic megacolon. Also, abdominal radiographs are very critical for the follow-up patient since it's easy to fall and easy to perform a uh, study. The treatment um, is quite straightforward. These patients are very often very ill. They need bowel rest, an anti-tube, often ICU monitoring uh, given their uh, state. High-dose IV corticosteroids can actually be given there's no increased risk of perforation with this. Uh, studies have shown that. And then broad-spectrum antibiotics. 
Um, the patients need to be evaluated for surgery if there's no, uh, or if this disease progression or no improvement on best medical management. The other etiology um, is actually C. diff infection. It affects 1% of all hospitalized patients, with 0.3 to 4% actually going on to develop toxic megacolon. There can be a rapid progression um, from formal and C. diff colitis to death, so definitely these patients need to be evaluated surgically. Uh, there's no clear cut lines or guidelines when to take these patients to the OR. But some papers have proposed leukocytosis over 15 or 20,000, and then a lactate of over 5. However, there's been a high um, surgical mortality rate for fulminant C. diff colitis, up to 35%, and a lot of um, doctors are hesitant to actually go on to do present uh, surgery. For the medical management, um, first, the inciting antibiotic needs to be stopped. Then an antibiotic treatment with oral vancomycin and IV flagell and needs to be started and the patient uh, evaluated for surgery. And next, I would like to uh, present one treatment strategy that has actually been proposed in 2009 by Neil et al. What he uh, performed was a diverting loop ileostomy and he performed colonic lavage um, for 10 days of vancomycin enemas. Uh, in 43 patients, was a prospective single institution study, no control group. And he had quite surprising results. He had a drastic reduction in mortality to 90% from 50. Um, and 70% or uh, close to 80% of the patients had a successful reversal of the ileostomy within six months of the operation. However, the study had quite a few limitations. It was single institution. There was no control group. He had a small number of patients. And to date, no study has managed to reproduce these um, drastic reduction in mortality. Certainly, uh, larger RCTs are needed to confirm these results and establish this therapy um, in the clinical practice. So already at the end of the presentation, I'd just like to go over some take-home messages. Uh, CT imaging is the modality of choice in colorectal obstruction. Uh, both Hartman's procedure and primary stimosis are valid options depending on the patient population and depending on the presentation. Caution should be used um, with colonic stents. Conservative management is at the forefront for pseudo-obstructions. Uh, here is an example, the high success rate for <coughs> neostigmine. And then that there are sur different surgical options for C. diff colitis and these, that these patients need to be evaluated for surgery given the possible fall in the course. Thank you very much for this very nice overview. Thank you. Uh, I have just two comments, maybe. The, you uh, present all the, those things. There are emergency uh, uh, settings, so it's, uh, I think it's a relevant topic to everybody. And um, the first comment is about stenting. You nicely showed that these... Uh, uh, this treatment uh, is not very uh, successful. Initially, there was uh, was very enthusiastic about this stenting, and uh, we have more and more data now that uh, show that this is not really the, the treatment of choice in these patients with colonic uh, malignant obstruction. Um, so this treatment has largely been abandoned. There are very rare cases where patients cannot be operated uh, or um, have a, a, an uh, anticoagulation that cannot be stopped or anything like that. Then uh, stenting can be uh, an option, but that has very rare cases. And the, the second comment is about the toxic megacolon, very important topic as well. Has been become very rare due to the, the good treatment of IBD population with our gastroenterologist. But we have a few very rare cases that present uh, with toxic megacolon and don't they need to be picked out. So are there any questions? Well, I mean, number one, I think uh, congratulations. A very difficult topic you did. Uh, I mean, difficult, I mean, it's common, but you cover a lot of different options, a lot of information. And I think here, that's also important in training, this is good to learn, to learn in book, but you need to see the patients. I think the way to really know this for residents and always to be involved 
in these cases to follow the cases and to learn. And this is one example with the limitation of hours and whatever that I think many people uh, don't have the expertise they should have in that. And the one who may suffer from that are patients. That means all of us, one day we may go in centers where the resident or maybe the other one who will treat me or treat us has seen one or two. And that makes a big difference. I mean, this is a lot of uh, information here, but the reality with these patients sometimes really need some, some experience. I, I have two questions. I wanted, in fact, to ask the stent because I'm a bit surprised and I will not be surprised that in two or three years come another paper and stent is the way to go. And uh, I have example, I'm not very much involved with this patient, but I have at least two patients, one who really, I think, uh, benefit so much from a stent. They came in acute obstruction with left cancer stent, they were there, and then uh, operated in a delay manner, and then uh, did not have a stoma and did extremely well. So that's just cases. So I think I will caution, I think uh, I did not um, do not read all the literature, I was not aware about this study from the Netherlands, but there's a lot here of techniques, <coughs> the ability of the people to place the stent, etc. So. I mean, here I would not suggest that the stent is the gold standard today, but I would not be surprised that very soon someone, a uh, group, come with either a better stent or better technique and it become the standard. Because that's an obvious way for me, someone, to bridge, to let the patient recover a little bit, and then to do a maybe less invasive, better oncologic operation that, uh, that what we are doing here. Maybe one comment about the Önema, just tell us, because many of these patients arrive with megacolon or, or, or the Olgilvy or whatever, and then they have some Önema or they have colonoscopy and disaster. The few cases I can remember was in fact uh, colonoscopy in some of these situations and end up to absolute disaster. Uh, here, so maybe I would like to insist on some uh, recommendation here about colonoscopy or even enema in in the real world of this patient presenting with uh, some sort of uh, of obstruction in this. Yes, thank you very much. It's a very important <laughs> issue about uh, um, colonoscopy should be performed with with uh, caution. Um, there are rare cases where colonoscopy can be performed and, and should be performed. For example, in, in pseudo-obstruction, colonoscopy can be performed if conservative, conservative measures are not successful. Um, you need to have an, an, an experienced endoscopist and they usually perform the endoscopy with water. Um, and uh, in these uh, cases, they, they can perform a decompression and, and actually uh, save the patient from, a, from an emergency operation. In other cases, for example, like malignant obstruction, we are very conservative with colonoscopy because there's an air trapping behind the stenosis. And uh, we have several cases uh, where the, the cecum has been blown up and actually perforated. So we are very conservative in, in those situations. <coughs> and that's the same thing that what you mentioned with the stenting. That's uh, also a problem when they place the, stem, the stent, uh, that there's an air trapping and uh, the colon behind, especially the cecum, can be dilated and, and perforated. So that's... Um, one of the reasons why, um, why stent placement and colonoscopy in these settings should be uh, performed in very selected cases. But as you mentioned, there are also some nice examples where the stent placement had to, a resolution of the, the problem and, and uh, an, an operation in an elective setting could be performed. Show here for the pseudo obstruction that the uh, diameter of bigger than 12 centimeters you should resect. But is there a cutoff until when you can do the decompression of these patients? To be honest, no, there is no such uh, limit. There's also no limit where you should do a resection like 12 centimeters. That's kind of arbitrary. Um, so this um, is mainly also a clinical decision. Uh, when you should do a colonoscopy, when you, you try to do a decompression, when you go straight to the OR, that uh, has to be done at the patient bed. And another <laughs> short question to the detection of the toxic megacolon. If I remember correct, I mean, uh, the distension is just six centimeters, right, is the definition. It's a re pr relatively mild distension. And uh, um, how can I detect, I mean, it's, it's not so, uh, such a specific distension, so how can I detect this disease? 
Also a very good question. Um, of course, this has to be put also in the clinical setting. If you see a dilation uh, without uh, clinical signs, uh, it's, it's hard to talk about the pseudo-obstruction. But if you do, uh, then, uh, then you have to put this into the clinical frame. Um, there's a difference between the, the diamet diameter of the, of the cecum and of the, of the transverse colon. Uh, the limits are a bit different. Uh, I mean, just uh, one technical question. If you have to resect, what kind of anastomosis do you prefer? If you have a colonic obstruction and you have to resect and the colon is dilated and you want to do an anastomosis, which kind of anastomosis would you... If you have, for example, an, an obstruction on the, on the right side, we usually perform a side-to-side -side, uh, uh, anastomosis, stapler. stapler anastomosis. And if you have a, a left-sided obstruction, usually you also do an end-to-end -end, uh, anastomosis, also usually, usually performing a, a, st a stapler as well. Um, there's always the question, should you, do you trust your anastomosis or do you need to have a protection um, in addition to that, uh, put a, a loop ileostomy. Okay. Good. Thank you, Thank you very much.